This is Duke University. Some of us were in Washington over the last couple of days. I was there. There have been lots of words and phrases used to um, describe that experience. But lots of folks talked about it in terms of its reality, how real and genuine people felt and the kinds of feelings that they expressed very directly, the kind of openness, the kind of sense of community, the kind of um, straight connection with each other. So I think tonight you'll get um, a real taste of direct, straight communication from one of the leading, leading journalists in our country. So we're really very, very happy to have uh, Soledad O'Brien with us this evening. And I just excerpted some things from her bio uh, that really could have taken a few pages. But let me just give you a couple of highlights on Soledad O'Brien. Soledad O'Brien is an anchor and special correspondent for CNN Special Investigations Unit, reporting hour-long documentaries throughout the year and filling, filing in-depth series on the most important ongoing and breaking news stories for all major CNN programs. She also covers political news as part of CNN's, quote, best political team on television. Ms. O'Brien came to CNN from NBC News, where she had anchored the network's Weekend Today show and contributed reports for the weekday Today show and weekend editions of NBC Nightly News, covering such notable stories as John F. Kennedy Jr.'s plane crash and the school shootings in Colorado and Oregon. In 2003, she covered the space shuttle Columbia disaster and later anchored NBC's weekend coverage of the war in Iraq. Additionally, in 1998, she traveled to Cuba to cover Pope John Paul II's historic visit. At CNN, Ms. O'Brien co-anchored the network's flagship morning program, American, American Morning, and reported from the scene during Hurricane Katrina, the tsunami in Thailand, and the terrorism attacks in London, gaining numerous awards and critical acclaim for her work. Ms. O'Brien anchored and reported a highly acclaimed CNN Special Investigating, Investigations Unit documentary featuring a never-before-seen look at Dr. King's private writings, notes, and teachings, which represent the foundation of his life's work as a preacher and human rights activists. Most recently, Ms. O'Brien has reported for CNN Presents Black in America, which I suspect lots of people in this audience have seen. A sweeping CNN on-air and digital initiative breaking new ground in revealing the current state of black America 40 years after the assassination of Dr. King. The landmark programming features six hours of documentaries and weekly reports with a focus on fresh analysis from new voices about the real lives behind the stereotypes, statistics, and identity politics that frequently frame the national dialogue about blacks in America. I hope you'll look forward to Black in America 2, which will focus on solutions this July. She was part of the team that won a George Foster Peabody Award for its Katrina coverage and an Alfred I. DuPont Award for his coverage of the tsunami disaster. In 2007, she garnered a Gracie Allen Award for her coverage of the Israeli-Hezbollah conflict. Also that year, the NAACP honored her with its President's Award. I want to say just a couple of words about some of the, just a few of the special awards that Ms. O'Brien has garnered to give you a sense of her connection and engagement with diversity. The People en Español Award, which focused on the 50 most beautiful people in 2004. Oh. Essence Magazine's 40 under 40 citation. Black Enterprises 40 long time ago. under 40. <laughs> no. That was last year. <laughs> The Mickey Leland Humanitarian Award from the National Association of Minorities in Cable. 
and she has been named several times to Irish American magazine's top 100 Irish Americans. She is, a, she is a graduate of Harvard University and a member of the National Association of Black Journalists and the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. I give you Soledad O'Brien. Thank you, what a nice introduction. Thank you for the great introduction, although you left out something very important to me, which is I am uh, most importantly a mother. I have four children, um, twin boys who are four, and uh, two girls who are six and eight. Um, you know, it's funny because you'll, you'll tell people, you know, we won a, a, a DuPont, which is a very huge award in journalism for our coverage of the tsunami, and they'll be like, oh, great. And you say, oh, we won a, a Peabody, another huge award in journalism for our coverage of Katrina. Oh, good for you. Say, I have four kids at one point under four. They're like, oh my God, that's unbelievable. Um, I want to welcome you and I want to thank you for having me. Um, one of the things I really enjoy about speaking to uh, groups that are made up of primarily students is that I think students ask great questions. We're going to have time for questions at the end and I want to encourage you, stand up and ask what's on your mind. As the students who I had a chance to talk to earlier at dinner uh, found, I give very straight answers to very straight questions and I enjoy them and I am happy to tackle anything you want to throw my way and anything I can't answer, I'll be happy to tell you I can't answer it. So I hope we have a really good uh, conversation uh, after I give you my remarks. Um, I spent the last 30 hours over the last four days reporting on the coming inauguration and of course the day itself. And really, you know, when you reflect on what a moment for this country, when you realize that the Constitution said that African Americans are three-fifths of a human being. I mean, the, what we have built our country on said that a lot of people who look like us in this room are worth three-fifths of a human being. And on January 20th, one of those people took the oath of office for the highest office in the land. I mean, think about, think about <laughs> not just what it says about Barack Obama and his political skills, et cetera, but think about what that says about our nation. You know, what it says about the potential what is possible, and not just for black people in this country, what it says about everybody's potential. You know, it's funny to talk about, um, to talk with members of Dr. King's family, his surviving children, and his sister, and you would ask them, well, you know, so is the dream, have we made the dream, realize the dream, and they would say, why yes and no, <laughs> very quickly, which is yes, clearly part of it, no question, milestone has been reached, history was made, uh, but clearly, no. The day after the inauguration, a lot of things stayed the same for a lot of people in this country. Their reality did not change. So I, I always feel that that's really important to emphasize. On Wednesday, a lot of people's lives did not change at all. I think, though, what has led Barack Obama to victory is this message of hope and access to opportunity and change. One of the things that was interesting to see during the campaign was to see the ways in which his opponents tried to capitalize on that message. You may have noticed it. I think Hillary Clinton was doing change with experience, and I forget what John McCain's, but everyone kind of tried to glom onto the change message because the change was working. And it was very interesting. I mean, in our polling, you could see change. The nation was ready for the message of change. What has been incredible, I think, is that both Barack Obama and Dr. King operated under the notion that our Constitution, which, if you think about it, forged this really incredible democracy that makes up America, had these huge flaws, huge. But that the genius of our nation was its ability to change. I mean, that was the genius of the nation, is that every time we go down a course, we manage somehow to correct course. I mean, and, and if you think about other countries who've had a history far longer than we have, that's an amazing thing to be able to course correct. He talked about in his speech the, the patchwork of people who make this country great and also underscored that those people may all disagree heartily while making those contributions. 
And it's those contributions that make our nation strong. And I think that in itself, his argument that he proposed in his inaugural address is really the argument for diversity. I mean, I don't know that there's a better, more clear argument for it. If you look at Obama's victory by the numbers, and my job at CNN along with Bill Schneider was to calculate poll results, Barack Obama won 95% of the African American vote, which was 15% of the electorate. 71% of the Latino vote, 9% of the electorate. 68% of new voters, 11% of the electorate. 67% of young voters, 18% of the electorate. 52% of the Asian vote, a very small portion of the electorate, frankly. 43% of the white vote, 74% of the electorate. You cannot win, when people would say, well, it's black people voting for, you cannot win on the black vote in this country. Black people make up just under 15% of the electorate. So when people say black people put him into office, a bunch did, but he couldn't have won with black votes. <laughs> and he couldn't have won with black and Asian votes. And he couldn't have won black and Asian and Latino votes. You had to have a coalition. You had to have, frankly, what his opponents called a movement. They said, how do you run against a movement? And so I'd like to begin tonight by playing for you a little clip of our coverage on Martin Luther King Day which was the highest rated coverage in all cable channels. And I was so glad to know that the, the highest moment was when CNN played in its entirety the 17 minutes speech from Dr. King. No one ever plays the speech. Everyone does, I have a dream, and everyone's gonna live in brotherhood. And it's like, yeah, but that was at the end. There's a whole beginning. That was about the bad check being delivered to black people. <laughs> so let's play the whole speech. And so, I'd like to play a little bit of the speech, won't play the whole 17 minutes, and also play for you an interview I did with Clarence Jones with a little insight about how that speech came about. So let's roll tape, please. Both a really incredibly worthwhile speech and uh, Clarence Jones's remarks. Um, when you come into the world with a name like Maria de la Soledad Teresa Marchetti O'Brien, which is what my parents named me, um, <laughs> and then I got married, so I have a, another name at the end of that, uh, you sort of end up spending your whole life talking about diversity. And it really is consistent with the theme, not only of Martin Luther King Day, but of, I think, the Obama campaign. In 2008, you can't help but talk about diversity, and people talk about the business case of diversity, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But for me, the stories about how people of color are, are reflected raise lots of troubling questions. And you know, in part of our documentary, Black in America, uh, we followed a family called the Rands. And the Rands gather every two years, 300 strong in the Rand family. And they went down to Atlanta this year, and at one point in the story, we're following them, and they have a bunch of kids who got together, so all the cousins were together, sort of hanging out and playing. And one of the producers I was working with in one of the screenings we did looked at me and said, you never see this on TV. A bunch of 14, 15 year old kids just playing together. He said, we never see this on TV. One of the, some of the feedback I got from Black in America was about the rants. And someone said to me, I can't believe you put that family in. No family sends all their kids, no black family sends all their kids to college. The Rands had six kids, and part of the documentary, we were showing them taking their youngest off to school. I said, I'm one of six. My parents dropped all of us. Actually, by the time they got to me, they're like, call us when you get there, you'll be fine. <laughs> but my point is, people don't think that exists, and that's problematic. Certainly, the just past election cycle helps put a more diverse face and voice on TV. I mean, you know, you watch CNN's election coverage, we had like 18 rows of people of color on CNN, which was a great thing. Um, history was made, and so obviously times are changing. But I do think, in this day and age, when we think about diversity, we're all gonna have to think about thinking differently, is the only way you can put it. I was talking to a woman who runs the UN Food Bank, and she was telling me about a program that she wanted us to do a story on. And she was saying, you know, we had to figure out how to get eight-year-old girls in these African villages to, to go to school. 
And I said, well, what'd you do? She said, well, you know, the problem is that eight-year-olds are very valuable in the society to stay home and help the moms, et cetera, et cetera. They're very, uh, they're very helpful. They're old enough to be really useful at home, and so the parents don't send them to school. And she said, the problem for us was that if these eight-year-olds don't go to school, then they don't get educated enough that later we can come in and educate them as young women, because what they had discovered is if they put energy and effort into uh, teaching health care, for example, to young women, young women stayed in the community. Teach men, they tend to leave. They get married, they go with their wife's family. But you teach the women, they stay. She said, so the problem is, we actually have to get these eight-year-old girls through school but the families don't want to send them because they're valuable at home. I said, so what did you do? She said, well, we started thinking differently about the problem. She said, we sent the eight-year-old, all the kids to school, and anyone who went to school would get food in school, number one. She said, but then we also started sending home food. So anyone who came, went to school also took home food for their family. And she said, it was stunning, almost immediately, these little eight-year-old girls who nobody valued at all were people were like pushing me out the door to go to school because they knew they could become almost family providers. And what you found was not only the families were interested in the girls going to school, but the community was interested in these girls going to school, every child going to school. And without even realizing it, they ended up sort of creating this virtuous cycle within the community because then you could train those girls in healthcare, in medicine, in agriculture, and they stayed and made the community better. And to me, that was breathtaking because it was a really good example of sort of flipping the thinking and impacting in a massive way, massive societal implications, something that was kind of relatively simple. They just sort of switched their thinking on it. In New York City, there's a professor, Roland Fryer, who was trying to do something very similar. You might remember him. He was featured in our documentary, Black in America. And Roland Fryer is the youngest uh, African-American tenured professor at Harvard. He got his tenure at Harvard at 31. And um, someone said, black people, at, black professors at Harvard. Why are they in your documentary? Not a lot of black professors at Harvard. What he's been working on is fairly controversial. He's been studying the achievement differential between brown and black students and white students in public schools in New York City. And one of the things they do is because all the kids in New York City take these standardized tests, they pay them to learn. If you're in fourth grade, you can earn up to 250 bucks. If you're in seventh grade, you can earn up to $500 by linking a percentage of the score you get to how much money you get. And it's very controversial. He's got a lot of critics, and they hammer him in the press regularly. Uh, and I said to Professor Fryer, you know, so with all this criticism, why do you do it? And he said to me, look at the graduation statistics in this city. They are horrific. He said, this requires thinking differently about this problem. We cannot continue to march this direction and expect the results are going to change. That's a definition of insanity. So he said, what we're going to do is think differently about how to motivate young people. Will it work? Who knows? It's got two years of testing. They finished the first year. He said, let me tell you the story of a little boy named Jamal who's in his Dallas program. The Dallas program is a little bit different. They pay kids to learn, uh, pay kids uh, per book to read a book. And they pay them $2 per book up to 20 books. So Jamal is this fourth grader. And Dr. Fryer said he met him in the program. And he said, so Jamal, how many books did you read? And he said, I read 38 books. He said, 38? Why'd you read 38 books? And Jamal said, for the love of learning, sir. <laughs> I, said, I said, Roland, you did not believe him. He said, Soledad, this kid was a class B hustler at best at age nine. He said, but I said to Jamal, why read 20, why, why read 38 books? You're only getting paid for 20 books. He said, and this kid looks at me like I'm slow and says, I'm not gonna let my friends beat me. And he said, is this an indication of flipping something on its head? Is this an indication of a kid who is suddenly competitive about academics where he has never been before? I don't know, another year in testing. But again, it's about sort of flipping what everyone assumes and the way the path has always been on its head. 
Probably where we saw it most overtly was in Hurricane Katrina when that storm blew through. It, host, it, it revealed, as we all know now, a host of problems in that city that had been ignored for decades. But when you saw all the people at the convention center and the Superdome, I mean, the picture was very clear about what was happening in New Orleans. The people were poor, most of them were black, they were elderly, many of them, and they were basically stuck without food and water. And they had no political clout, and they were begging. We spent the first week after Hurricane Katrina uh, covering it from our studio, and then I interviewed uh, that Friday the FEMA director, Michael Brown, and at one point he started listing for me all the provisions that were making their way into New Orleans. And, and frankly, I thought to brag about, I mean, he listed, this is coming, this is on its way, this is on its way, and I, and I thought to brag about what was coming, you know, at the end of the week, for a storm that happened at the beginning of the week. When, when we got supplies into Banda Aceh, in two days. I mean, it's just unacceptable. The interview we did, of course, and more importantly, his actions during the storm led him to resign shortly afterward. But I, I think Katrina's probably been the most riveting story for me to cover. You know, New Orleans is now a city that I will never abandon. I'd only been to New Orleans once in my life before the storm struck, and now I go 30 times a year. And I remember driving into the city the wrong way on the highway because the one side of the highway, the right side, was underwater. And I've never had anyone snore in my speech before. <laughs> That's all right. Get comfortable. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Oh, it's okay. I'm not picking on him. It just never happened to me before. <laughs> All right, I'm moving on. Oh, got people. <laughs> Let's get back to Katrina because it's a serious story. People, people, people. I would never have mentioned it if I thought I was going to lose you all. One of the things that was amazing, we were in an RV and everything you brought into the city you had to pack in your RV. So the fuel, the water, the food, everything was what you could carry in. And there were 14 people who were sleeping in our RV and at night when we pulled in, uh, you could only see fires burning in the city because there was absolutely no electricity. But when the sun rose, you could see how devastating the devastated the city was. And there was families that were pushing literally everything they had in shopping carts, including their children. And they would come to us. I had just pulled into the city with armed guards. And they would say to me, where do I go? Where's the buses out of town? It was the most incredibly chaotic and horrible thing to see. We got into a parish. Uh, we were trying to get into Plaquemine Parish. We couldn't get in. We got into St. Bernard Parish. And I asked the sheriff, Jack Stevens, how much damage do you think you got? And he said, 100%. His parish that had 70,000 people living in it was hit by the storm, which then forced the water over the canal. So they were hit almost like by a tsunami. So the homes, you know, hurricane damage, as you saw in Katrina, is the structure stays and sort of things blow through and damage it. The homes in St. Bernard Parish were wiped off their foundation like a tornado. It's a very different kind of damage. And I said to him, so do you think race was a factor in the, cover in, in the, the response to your disaster? And he said, well, yes and no. There's no question the very first visuals were of people of color, mostly, uh, who were poor. He said, but my city's, my parish is 97% white. We have very few black people here. We were ignored, too. It was a socioeconomic issue. We have no political power. No one particularly wanted to come to rescue us. And the rich people along the lakefront were ignored too. The most horrifying thing, I think, in that coverage for me was the bodies, frankly, that would just appear as you drove by shopping malls. There would just be bodies. There were just bodies floating everywhere. I, I'm not sure that translated well in our coverage. We went in with deputies to break into a home at the request of a family member who hadn't heard from a loved one. and as rescuers lowered themselves in, you could just see people floating in the house. The smell of death was in the streets. It was a horrible thing. And during our live shots, because I did a morning show that would start when it was so dark, as the sun came up, you could see 
blue tarps. And what they did was they would, because they couldn't actually gather up the bodies, they would take them and wrap them in blue tarp and then tie them down and tie them under the bridges and then GPS them so they could come back and get them later. And so as the sun came up, you'd see just blue tarp bobbing behind you in your live shot because they were too busy to get dead bodies out of the water in a major city in America. We need more voices. We need more representation, not just of people of color, but of all socioeconomic classes as well. It's not okay that people are ignored. It's just not okay in this country. You know, in business, and I'm sure many of you who are business majors know this better than I, it's very trendy to talk about a business case for diversity, and that is basically why it makes sense to the bottom line. In other words, it's not just a moral imperative. Uh, diversity is not just the right thing to do. And, and there's a guy named Scott Page who's really worth looking up. Uh, he's written a good book about diversity, and his lectures on diversity are really fascinating. And his theory is this. As we move from a society that makes things, widgets, to a society that has a knowledge economy, where we solve problems, things are done in teams. Teams that consist of the same kind of person are less likely to come up with a diverse range of solutions. So, and I used this example earlier at our dinner, if you're defining your team, let's not talk about gender, let's not talk about race, team of engineers. And you have a team over here, which is a team that includes a school teacher, a ballet dancer, a football player, a doctor, a lawyer, whatever. The team that consists of all engineers is not necessarily the best team in a knowledge economy to solve the question, how do we better engage kids in learning in school? They probably all have a similar background. The team that is made up of a diverse group of people from all backgrounds, who probably don't see eye to eye on a lot of stuff, will probably come up with a range of solutions from here to here, regardless of gender, and not talking about race. Diversity is a worthwhile thing to pursue. Mr. Page, in his book, has a graph, and it shows the accuracy with which people can guess the weight of a steer, which I had no idea people do, but apparently they do. And uh, he has this mathematical no model that shows uh, that when you have a diverse crowd at the county fair, 1,100 people in his example, they all take a guess at the steer's weight. He says they actually, when you average it out, are within one pound of the steer's actual weight. When you take the four or five best guessers and you take a look at how much they're off by, it's significantly more. Just by virtue of being wide and diverse, you add value. So let's talk about how that works in a school situation or on the job, there's more than one way to answer a problem on the job. You're problem solving, again, knowledge economy. And often we talk about people who uh, are successfully smart, like your IQ number, which I would argue, and Mr. Page argues too, um, is not really the most important thing you bring to a school, and not really the most important thing you bring to the office, your IQ number. You bring a box of things. In your box is your IQ number. In your box is your sense of humor. In your box is your past experiences. In your box is how well you relate to people. In your box is are you a good presenter. In your box is how comfortable, blah, blah, blah. Big box. That box is a far more accurate and important description of who you are than that number, which is part of the box. It's the tools in that box that get there by your experience. And so I think you have to think about diversity on many levels. In black in America, the team that worked on that project was very big. And we had just the black people alone, people who are Hispanic and black, black people from Africa, biracial black, middle class black, people from impoverished backgrounds were black, black and gay. And that's just the black people on the documentary. I'm not even going to talk about the other people on the documentary. A documentary, of course, needs to have a wide scope and cover a wide range of topics and have many voices heard. I mean, we're sort of the perfect example of the knowledge economy. Now, I suppose in steer guessing, it's fine to pick anybody. Uh, but if you're talking about business school or college, you need high ability combined with high diversity. 
And inherently, if you're looking for different perspectives, of course you look at different genders and different socioeconomic experiences, and of course you look at race. Now the one thing that Mr. Page says, but no one else tells you, but I'll tell you, is that it's not easy. It's very, 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 very challenging. The editorial meetings we had in Black in America would be a very good example. When everybody's voice is heard, and the range is from here to here, it's a lot of unpleasant conversations. And people don't tell you that. Well, it's kumbaya, let's have diversity. Diversity means a lot of yelling and arguing about those solutions. Diversity is not a nice, comfortable, little tight box. Let's run in and do a little diversity. And I'm like, no, it doesn't work like that. The end result, though, is not one person's vision that has somehow been pushed through, but multiple visions. And that's the business case for diversity. But of course, there are these far-reaching implications of the business case. And that would be role models, obviously. I was not long ago in Wisconsin, and I was being interviewed by a woman who is uh, Japanese, half Japanese and half white. And she said to me during our interview, you know, Soledad, people at this station say, I'm a young Soledad O'Brien. <laughs> I said, girl, I'm the young Soledad O'Brien. <laughs> but I think, when I'm being charitable, I think what she meant was, when she sees me, she sees it is possible for her too. When all people see a Barack Obama, they think it's possible for them too. As I said a couple of times in our coverage during the uh, inauguration, well, before I left home, my six-year-old daughter, Cecilia, said to me, so is he the first black president of the United States? I said, yes, he's going to be. No, really. I mean, he's the first black person to be president? Because at six years old, she's only lived through one president. <laughs> she's six years old. She's only lived through one president. Role models are crucial. When I was growing up, I loved uh, the local news. And anybody who spent any time in New York City would know Gloria Rojas. Now, Gloria Rojas would do the most Anglo presentation ever. Totally like, uh, later this day, the Senate is going to be discussing blah, 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 blah. And then she'd get to her name, and she'd say, reporting live, I'm Gloria Rojas. <laughs> so it was the craziest thing. I was like, but I loved it. Because I thought, well, if Gloria Rojas can be a reporter, then someone with a weirder name can be a reporter, too. The bottom line, and when I look back at my success, I think, the reason it happened was this. And it's not because I was ever smarter than anybody else. And in fact, for many years, the fact that I had a Harvard degree worked against me because a lot of the first jobs in TV news, if there's any journalism majors here, it's all about fetching coffee. And so, you know, that was, people thought I wouldn't want to fetch coffee and, and remove staples from bulletin boards, which is pretty much how I supported myself for my first few years in TV. Uh, but I think it was about staying in the game. And sorry, are you a journalism major? Yeah, that's reality. <laughs> oh, and also it doesn't pay well. Um, but I think what worked, what it was about, was about staying in the game. When Drew Gilpin Faust was appointed the first president of Harvard, I was asked by Time Magazine to write an article about the impact that she would have on girls and young women. And so in the article, I told the story about my sister Estella, who was at Harvard three years ahead of me, and she was a physics major. And she was constantly pressured to drop that major because girls don't succeed in physics, and minorities don't succeed in physics. And I called her and I said, so you got a lot of this subtle pressure. And she's like, it wasn't subtle. People called me up and said, girls don't succeed in physics. <laughs> minorities won't succeed in physics. I was like, oh, wow. She finished Harvard in three years, and she went on to get her master's in astrophysics, and then her MD and her PhD. Apparently, she was pretty good at physics. <laughs> She's an eye surgeon today in Harlem. But every step of the way, and I mean literally, every step of the way she was told, women do not succeed doing this, and minorities do not succeed doing this. So why did she stick it out? I think the only way to answer that question is to tell you a little story about my parents. My mom and dad met in 1958 in Baltimore, Maryland. My mother is black and from Cuba, and my dad is white and from Australia. And my mother told the story of how they met. 
which was a daily mess. My dad would drive his car, she would walk, and he would wind, well, they used to have windows that wound down in cars, people. <laughs> Believe it or not, no iPods, cars with windows that rolled down. Uh, and he would wind down the window of his car and he would say, would you like a ride? And my mother would say, no thank you, because you don't take a ride from a stranger, she would tell us. And I'm like, God, even a stranger going to daily mass who you see every day? Like, if you can't take a ride from that guy, who can you take a ride from? <laughs> but I digress. Uh, and every day my dad would drive by and wind down the window and say, would you like a ride? And every day she would say, no thank you. And then one day she said, yes I would. And they decided to go on a date. Well, hang on, it gets worse. Uh, <laughs> and so, in Baltimore in 1958, they went on a date. And every restaurant they went to wouldn't serve them, because my mother's black and my dad's white. Every single place they went to, they were turned away. They'd say, he could come in, but you cannot come in, and you certainly cannot sit together. And so, my mother took my father back to her apartment, and because she's a fabulous cook of wonderful Cuban food, uh, she made him dinner. And my mother would tell us that story, not to highlight the painfulness of discrimination and segregation, but to say, girls, if you could cook, you could get a man, <laughs> truly. <laughs> well, I Although I will say, I like to say, I don't make it, but I make it happen. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. I got four kids, I don't have time to cook. But, even though I was being lectured to cook, which I cannot do at all, I can microwave, my mother, we took a greater point from that. We took the bigger point, which was, if people put out obstacles for you, then step around them. If you wanna do something, then do it. Dream it and do it and work hard. And so when I went to get a, a job, a reporter's job, in Springfield, Massachusetts, 1993, and the guy gave me a tour of, uh, of the whole station, and it was a really good interview, and we got to the end, and he said to me, here's the problem, I only have one position for a black person, and you're not dark-skinned enough, you won't look black. Nice, I was like, wow, should I be offended that they have one spot for black people? <laughs> or should I be more offended that I won't get that one spot not long after, I had an interview at a station in Hartford, Connecticut, and the guy said to me, we really like you, but the problem is, Soledad is such a complicated name. Would you ever think of changing it? And since Maria de la Soledad, for those of you who do not speak Spanish, loosely translated, is the Virgin Mary, <laughs> and since I had no interest in being struck by lightning on my way home, I said, no, I wouldn't change my name. <laughs> but I called my mother both times after those experiences, sobbing. And she said, heart of stone, by the way, she said, you'll get another job. Get another job. You don't want to work there anyway. Get another job. And you know what? She was right. But it's not easy to be judged in one glance whether it's because you're a woman, you're a person of color, you're a mother, you're pregnant. When I worked at NBC News, I was eight and a half months pregnant with my second daughter, Cecilia, and I had pitched a story to go to Guantanamo to do some of the first pictures out of Gitmo because if you remember, they were holding prisoners there, but no one knew what the facility really was. And remember, there was a lot of controversy, there were no pictures, and so we got permission to go in and show some of the very first pictures and the network loved the story, and they loved the story so much that they gave it to a guy who was not eight and a half months pregnant to go do my story. And so I did what any self-respecting, water-retaining, pregnant, pissed-off person would do, <laughs> which was to pitch a giant hissy fit till I got to go cover my own story. But it's exhausting to always have to push against the stereotype of what people think you can do, for whatever reason it is. When I was covering the tsunami, I used to get calls from the young women, mostly, who would run the, women, who would run the desk, and they would say to me, so who's taking care of your kids? I'd say, the same people who take care of them when I'm angry. I don't stash them under the desk, <laughs> believe it or not. They have a father, he watches them. 
In my business, you have to be willing to travel or it ends your career. And as anybody who has children knows, and at the time I had four-month-old twins, I was never happier in my life to get on a plane by myself <laughs> and leave my four children under the age of four behind. I remember the flight attendants would come over and off, you know, on uh, Singapore Air, that's the most fabulous service ever, and they'd come over and on, I was like, go away, I'm having personal time, go away. <laughs> you have to push back on those stereotypes all the time. It's frustrating, it's not easy. I want to play for you a little bit of our documentary, Black in America, the story of Professor Michael Dyson, because I think that's an interesting story where he confronts this very issue. And he talks about some of the stereotypes that he thinks affected the different paths that his brother took and he took in life. So I'd like to play that, please. And there was no right answer or wrong answer. There was no, there were people's opinions and thoughts and, and I hope that it would spark a, a dialogue about a lot of stuff that we just don't talk about. We never discuss. I want to leave you with the story of a guy who wanted to get into politics because it's, it's a story about what we as a group can do with all this information we have. This guy, he, tells me, he told me the story himself. He said he was interested in getting into local politics, and so he had to go to this woman in the neighborhood who you had to sort of you know, kiss the ring and, and get her permission to enter the local races. And so she said to him, all right, she brought him out to the courtyard and said, tell me what you see. It's Newark, New Jersey. And Newark, New Jersey, for any of you who are from Newark, New Jersey, or know anybody from Newark, New Jersey, know what uh, a challenging city that is and how much devastation it has and how much poverty it has. And she said, what do you see? So we went out in the courtyard and he said, um, okay, I see a crack house, I see a bunch of kids staying on the corner, I see a burned out building, I see more kids, I see a housing project, I see, and she went, we don't need you. You know, I asked you what you see, but for you to describe what you see there right now is not particularly helpful to us. What I'm asking you is, what do you see is possible? What can you imagine for Newark? Because we don't need politicians here who see this as the future of Newark. And he got it, and he's now the mayor of Newark, <laughs> Cory Booker. But I love that question. What do you see? What do you imagine? What's possible? You know, sitting around and wringing your hands and woe is me about what's in front of your face I'm sure it's very heartfelt, but it's not very useful. What do you see? What can you imagine? Then go build it and do it. And don't turn around and wait for the six other people to do it for you or do it without you. Just do it. As a rule, I don't like speakers who throw quotes into speeches because most of the time it's like, what does that quote even mean? And invariably they say, you know, it was Theodore Roosevelt who once said blah, 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 blah. Um, but there's one worthwhile quote. And so, and it's actually worth remembering, so I'm gonna give it to you. It's a quote that was supposedly President Kennedy's favorite quote, and it comes from Dante. And he says this, the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in times of great moral crisis maintain their neutrality. Think about that quote. He's not even saying that the people who do bad things, the hottest places in hell are not even reserved for them. It's the people around who don't do anything. That is the worst thing you can do, is do nothing and say nothing and not act when your voice is needed. That is the worst thing you can do. The time is now. We have an opportunity. And not just because there's an African-American president in the White House. Because there's change in the wind. People are interested People who differ politically, who differ ideologically, want change. They recognize that we were founded on something unusual and a little bit flawed, and we keep chugging along toward that more perfect union, and it's possible. We're now in a knowledge economy. 
We need that wide diversity of voices who will sit in a room and yell at each other, and it won't be pretty, and it won't be comfortable. But we need a lot of different solutions. Economic crisis, global warming, subprime problems, education is a huge one. They're not going to be solved by one guy who's got a lot of passion. They're not. They're going to be solved by all of us, appreciating each other's diversity, listening to each other's opinions, and not saying, I don't see color, because then you're just blind and maybe a little bit stupid, <laughs> saying, I see your color, and it doesn't limit at all what I think we can do. That is really the potential of America. It really is. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time this evening. I would love to take any questions, and I know there's a microphone here, and there's a microphone here, so why don't you just line up, and don't be shy, and ask whatever you'd like. Go ahead. Thank you, Ms. O'Brien. My name is Josh Laxina, and I'm a student in the MD-PhD program at Duke, and my question to you was, it's been an observation that in times of great crisis, particularly in this country, out of those crises um, come rebirths and moments of great civil change. So the story that's dominating the news headlines right now is the economic crisis. And with um, your finger to the pulse of the news stories of the world, what do you see as the hopeful stories that are beginning to emerge in the midst of this economic crisis? As devastating as the economic crisis is, I think one thing that we have needed in this country for a long time is a, a reset button. Uh, I work in an office where uh, the young women who are production assistants walk around in Jimmy Choo's, which costs $750 a pair on a salary that's under $50,000. But there's a sense from movies and, and uh, you know, sort of cultural experiences that that's okay, that's the way it's supposed to be, right? Because, I mean, everyone needs a pair of Jimmy Choo's. And there's something very odd. I mean, my daughter's friends and my daughter also don't have one American Girl doll. They have five or seven or nine. I mean, some insane number. Like, and so to some degree, if there is a silver lining of the economic crisis, it'll be that people sort of reset. I grew up in a home with five brothers and sisters. It, it, you know, our, our home was 2,000 square feet. Now, that would never happen with two bathrooms, four girls. You know, but there was a sense of, you don't get ahead of yourself. There was no sense of, I deserve, I deserve, I deserve. And you see it in the schools, I think. When I was a student, if you missed a practice, the coach wouldn't play you. That was it. My parents would be like, well, then don't miss practice. Now, the parents call up and complain. Now the parents call and say, actually, I'd like my son to start at shortstop. And do you know how much money I gave to the general fund last year? And you know I'm a lawyer, right? You know, it's a whole different sense of values. People are going for the end game and not the process. You know, because everyone can share the great story of how much it sucked to be poor, but how much you got out of the craziness of, you know, because you couldn't afford any, anything, you went out with your friends walking around and tried to make fun. I mean, you know, it's, I know I'm making me sound like I'm 65 years old, but there is a sense of process, you know, that getting there was part of the experience and part of, now it's about the end game. You know, people want their kid to be shortstop, they don't want him to learn. You know what, you can go from not being very good if you work really hard, and if you stay late and you practice and you deal with your disappointment and you turn that disappointment around, you can become not only a decent shortstop, you can become a better person for it. And you know what, that experience, even though it happened when you were 13, when you're 30, and you're trying to make your way through X, Y, Z on the job, you're going to refer back to that moment when coach put you in, even though you were the second string you know, shortstop, and you delivered. Instead, they just want to be the shortstop. That's a problem. 
And it's a problem I've seen in the one generation. I mean, it, it's very different from my childhood. And I'm 25. <laughs> so I do think if there's a silver lining in the economic crisis, we'll hit a reset button. And people will kind of get back to the process. And not so much about, you know, people used to ask me all the time, how did your parents send all your brothers and sisters to Harvard? I said, they did it by not caring about where we went to school. You know, if my parents, they knew, they wanted us to go somewhere that we liked, where we felt comfortable. They wanted us to feel like we were smart and learning. And if we decided to go to Harvard, then so be it, great. And if not, also fine. Because being a good human being was far more important than my parents being able to brag on us about going to Harvard. But you cannot tell your children, I value you for being a good human being, but I really want you to go to Harvard and I will be disappointed if you don't get in. So kids, end for the, you know, go for the end game. That's, they can't do that. So I think there is, an econ there is a, in the economic crisis, a silver lining. And people will kind of get back to what really matters. You know, it's an opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. You can't Hi. clap after every question. We'll never get through this night. <laughs> Hi, Ms. O'Brien. Oh, sorry. My name is Charmaine Webster, and I'm a junior. I'm here at Duke University, public policy major, music minor. Um, I, have <laughs> I have a couple of questions sure. for you. Um, one is, after watching the Black in America uh, series, one thing that I liked a lot were the stories that were told about different efforts being made in different communities. For example, the VIP program in Baltimore, uh, Maryland, to take the gang-related young men that are, you know, the, you know, and taking them in the hospital and like changing their lives around. Um, I was wondering, did you like hear a lot of information about people trying, trying to recreate similar programs um, in their cities after watching the Black in America documentary? We did actually, and that's why we decided to do Black in America Two Solutions, because at the end of Black in America, people said to me, well, we're all teed up to do something, but what do you want me to do? And I was like, I don't know, I'm a journalist. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a community organizer. You know, so, uh, so we really decided that one of the things to do was to, to to take all those stories that were working, that could be recreated, and since we had such incredible ability to market during the first Black in America, to use that same thing and do town halls around what's working, what things have worked, what has failed. But you know, I think one of the things we went into in Black in America was to be very blunt. You know, you can't have these conversations and sort of pussyfoot around the issues. You, you, you just have to kind of be blunt about it. So you can't take programs that everybody loves and say, well, we, we love that one, so we're just going to keep that one. No, does it work or does it not? Is it serving children or does it not? You know, and that's a harsh question to ask, because some things are very beloved. But in order to make real change, you have to really confront the truth. Right before Black in America aired, a couple of different people stopped me and said, oh, you know, when this airs, you're going to be in a lot of trouble if you're going to say stuff about the black community. I said, you know, I'm much more concerned about not saying things. I'm much more concerned about doing a piece that people look at and say, that is crap. That this is not real. This is not real. It's a very nicely, you know, puff piece on heroes in a community, but it's not real. So how do we do a piece that is nuanced and smart and good journalism and prov thought provoking and represents a wide range of people? I mean, think of all the different viewpoints that were in that one piece. A lot. A lot of issues were raised. So, you know, I, I think that, that that really is sort of, you know, the, the strategy. And then my second question. No, you have to say, if you're going to be a journalist, you got to say, a follow-up, Mr. President. <laughs> I don't plan on being a journalist, but thank you. <laughs> no, no, um, I guess a follow-up question to that would be, um, a lot, well, after Black in America um, aired, a lot of people in my community from, I guess, all social classes, said that, well, well, that wasn't for us, you know. I'm black, I know what it means to be black, you know, this was not for black people. And what would you say in response to people that made those kind of comments? You know, that's an interesting question. And, and I guess I would say it never really occurred to me that I was doing journalism for certain people. The way I do documentaries is to find good stories and make sure they have an, an arc, a plot, some kind of conflict, something happening. So that while you're watching, you say, God, I need to go to the bathroom, but I don't want to go because in case it came out of commercial, I don't want to miss anything. You know, when I covered the tsunami, it never occurred, and I was based in Phuket, Thailand. It ne I never thought, well, I know all the white people will be turning out, but the Thai people will be with me. 
<laughs> you know, in Katrina, everyone was affected by that. Even though the, the faces were primarily, you know, people of color. It was a, a story about humanity. You know, so I think at any time you can do, you know, that story about Professor Dyson and his brother, yeah, we know that story, but that was a riveting story. So I, I don't know, I, I think that it, I don't do journalism for different people. I just try to do really good stories and make the people who are the storytellers for us, like Professor Dyson and his brother, you know, do solid interviews with them. And, and you hope that if you do it right, it really shouldn't matter you know, who you're telling the story about. I mean, there's so many more documentaries I want to do. We're going to do Latino in America in October, I think. It's going to air. We're going to do Gay in America in 2010. We're pitching Muslim in America. We're pitching Native American in America. I think I've hit on a theme. Uh -huh. <laughs> but you know, like, I, if, if your theory is, well, this is for Native Americans, well, you're going to have a very small viewing audience. You know, it has to be about themes that make us all human. And that's why we relate and care about each other. And so that's kind of the same thing you, you put into journalism, I, I think. Thank you. My pleasure. Go ahead. My name is Janitria Cuthbertson, and I'm a um, Master's of Divinity student and Master's of Social Work. So from that social work piece, when I saw um, Black in America, and as you were talking about earlier about thinking on your head, thinking on it, turning and thinking on his head. Um, thinking on your head is what my daughter does. <laughs> <laughs> she does handstands and tries to do her homework. <laughs> in terms of um, the minority community and taking personal accountability, um, in programs, one of the things, education is one of my interests, and I just would like to know your thoughts on personal accountability um, in terms of thinking about programs. Like, you can think of all these programs, but it won't substitute, you know, the home, and um, how just even having an African-American president will even play how that, you know, because now they're saying, well, okay, you know, it's like you were saying earlier, it's all equal now in terms of African-Americans. Is that clear? Yeah, no, I, you're oh. right. I mean, I've heard that a, a lot. You know, I, I think that when we look, one of the people we've done interviews for in Black in America Solutions is a guy named Stephen Perry. He's a PhD. He runs a charter school. So he's very community-based, trying to, and in his charter school, which, by the way, in his community in Hartford, Connecticut, they have the lowest graduation rates and the lowest number of kids going off to college. His particular charter school has 100% of their students go to four-year colleges, 100%. Part of that is because Dr. Perry drives around in his car and picks up people and brings them to school. Mm -hmm. Sometimes their parents just do not care. I mean, he says some of the parents will tell him, yeah, they're 14, they're grown, I can't tell them what to do. He says, I can tell them what to do, get in the car, I'm bringing you to school. <laughs> but you know, I mean, it's a, it's so, so, it's a combination of things. Um, Dr. Perry was telling me the story about, he gave me a tour of his school, and we were shooting it for the documentary, and they took me to the science department. And in the science department, it's it, because it's, it's, in, it's in a classroom on a community college, there, there, there are no sinks. There's no running water. There are no Bunsen burners in their entire science department. None. They do science experiments out of books. I, I, I never, I mean, I thought like Bunsen burners, you had, that was what defined a science class. And I said to him, you know, how do you possibly compete? Because they're a public school, so they compete with Greenwich High School and North Fairfield High School, the best public schools, not only in the state, but in the country, mm -hmm. and the wealthiest. He said, well, I'll tell you a story. And he showed me all these different awards they'd gotten for sports. But he said, this is the one I'm most proud of. And he held up this little, kind of tacky little plaque. And it was from a CSI award. They had won the criminal, what is it again? <laughs> Crime scene investigator. Sorry, I, I have such trouble with that. And he said, when the students called to tell them that they had won for the state, he said, well, won what? What part of it do we win? He said, we won the whole thing. I said, you won the whole thing? There's no special category for us? He said, no, we won the whole thing. They had two cops come in and teach the kids about how you do crime scene investigation. The English teacher, who knows nothing about CSI, volunteered her time. All the other schools had science teachers helping the students. But they kind of cobbled together. And he said, you know, we don't think about what we don't have. We think about what we do have and what we can get. Yeah, I mean, for a guy who has a school with no Bunsen burners, to win the CSI award for the state is an incredible thing. And so that is a great news story and a bad news story. 
Why are some of those parents not invested in their kids? Why is the principal picking them up? He said to me, we had a game, homecoming game. I had more teachers in the stand than parents. He said, let me tell you about the school we compete with. They have to take two buses because they have so many parents, they put the parents on the second bus. You know, that's a reality. So at the community level, people have to say, then, it can't be their father, but maybe I can be like Steve Perry. I can't pick up five kids, but I can pick up one kid. Out of black in America, there's a young woman who you might remember in the piece, we shot her getting her HIV test. Her name is Naya. And at 16, she got pregnant, had a baby, and she was back at 18 to get her HIV test. And in the process of the interview, we talked about she thinks her, bro her boyfriend's unfaithful, that's why she was getting an HIV test, blah, 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 18 years old. And I said to her, Naya, you know, I'm not your mother, but I'm curious to know why are you having sex with a guy who, uh, unprotected sex, with a guy who you are telling me, who you met eight seconds ago, you think is unfaithful. So it's not like we know each other. We don't. So wh why, why? The rate of HIV infection for black women is huge. So explain that to me, because you're obviously a bright girl. And she said, well, I really couldn't answer the question. And I said to her, did you, you know, do you go, did you graduate from high school? She said, yeah, I did, actually. Even though she was pregnant and had a baby, she graduated from high school. I said, well, why don't you go to college? Well, I got, I can get in, I got into college. So why don't you go? I can't afford daycare for my son, who's 18 months old. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to pay for daycare for your son. I wrote, a not to her, I wrote a check to her. I said, tell me the name of the daycare facility. I will pay for daycare for your son for the next four years. And I expect you to go to college. And you know what she did? She broke up with her boyfriend the next day. Because you know what? If you don't feel like you have any cho choice or opportunity, then why the hell not have sex, unprotected sex with a guy? I mean, honestly. And this is not to tell you that I'm so great for paying for Naya's daycare, because the truth is Naya's daycare is incredibly inexpensive. It costs nothing. It costs nothing. Nothing. So, yeah, everybody should grab someone and figure out what they need and help them. You know, it's, it's just sort of simple. It, and it's unfortunate, but I don't know that we can sit around and wait for people to come in and rescue us and rescue our inner cities. You know, and, and there are people who say, well, why do you have a black woman on who's the face of HIV? That's a reality. And I'd like to dig into why a smart girl who wants to be a good mother is doing something really stupid. I don't get it. Well, we know. She doesn't think there's any other options for her. So it kind of doesn't matter. So I think the answer in your long way is figure out what your little piece can do. You know, and just clean up your little piece until you can do bigger than that and leverage other people into cleaning up their one little piece. It was funny, someone said, um, I was reading me this great quote the other day about a guy who walks along the beach throwing the, the um, starfish back in, and he said, you know, at some point, like, why are you doing this? There's so many starfish that are stranded, there's too many starfish, and he's like, well, it matters to that one starfish <laughs> that I throw him back in. You're right, I can't get to all of them, <laughs> but that one, actually, was really grateful. <laughs> and and, I, and they read that to me when I was telling them about Naya and how frustrated I was that I can't take on 25 Nayas. I can only take on my one Naya. Who told me, do you think it's expensive to get an inauguration ticket? I really want to go. I'm like, girl, <laughs> yes, you can't go. <laughs> go study. <laughs> Pick up the one starfish and throw it back in. And that's going to be good enough. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Judy Glasser. I'm not a student. I'm an educator. A uh, quick comment and a question. Uh, my comment is the show Black in America, when I was watching it with a bunch of kids, 18, 19, 20-year-olds, we talked about how there's no such thing as reality but merely people's perceptions. And that one show changed many people's perceptions that had been rooted for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years and it had a profound effect on everyone who watched it. A and it was just a phenomenally done show, so I, th I appreciate I thank that, you. although I have to say that was not my goal. My goal was that people would sit down after watching Professor Dyson and say, what do you think about that? When that guy says he's in jail because of the color of his skin, is that true or not? You know, I mean, that's the conversations we wanted to spur. It really literally was not about educating anybody on anything. It was just saying, okay, we raised some interesting issues. Let's talk about them. And so later when people would put up pictures of my kids and circle the ones that they thought looked black, 
And I remember I was very upset for a day. And I thought, you know what, you cannot start a difficult dialogue and then step out. Well, not me, you all go have that conversation. <laughs> you know, you gotta, okay, circle the, get my kids, what can I do? My question originally was going to be, have you ever put down your journalist hat, so to speak, and get involved in the story? God, all the time. <laughs> and, if you, and, and then you were talking about um, when you I were talking with Naya. I pay for kids' tuition in, in, in New Orleans. My husband's like, we have children <laughs> that we actually have to put through college. So yes, um, yes, I, I have. A, um, I, I actually will say uh, I have a foundation, and uh, because I'm here tonight, you guys have actually all contributed to that foundation. Frankly, because every dime I make when I give speeches goes directly to pay for Naya's college and her daycare, and Alexia, who is uh, in high school in New Orleans. Um, all that gets underwritten by people who donate money. Frankly, okay. thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Vanessa Marks. I'm a virology graduate student, third year, over at NC State. I study a virus that most people probably I don't care about. I thought you said viral, viral, virology. Virology, yes. <laughs> um, I was wondering, in such a technological advanced age, um, why does it seem like this generation cares or knows so little about all the civil wars or genocides that's going on around the world, and what can be done to inspire them to, to uh, create some kind of change or awareness. I actually think people do care a lot. I, I really do. I think it's very hard to figure out what to do. I mean, I can't get into Sudan. And I have a network that actually has tons of contacts and reporters who've been in Sudan. So I, I think there's something very frustrating about, well, what do I do? You know, and, and if you're not a Bill Gates, send over $200 million is what you do. You know, if that's not a, a reality, it, you don't really know what to do with your voice, and, and I don't know how to advise people what to do. Um, so I, I think it's not a lack of, I, I think that this generation gets a really bad rap for being not compassionate or not, you know, sort of ca caring and interested, and I, I think that's completely untrue. I mean, all you have to do is talk about Katrina, and people are, are riveted. People care so much, but people, me included, I want to give money and help directly to a person. You know, and I, it's why I say to Naya, girl, I pay the school, <laughs> and I expect to see a, a report card every semester. I want to see results. I want to see results. And so I, I think that it's really an issue of saying, how do I help and make an impact? And I think it's very hard to do that in genocide. I, I don't know what the answer is, outside of being educated about it and talking about it. I don't know you know, what more someone who is a student who has another life can possibly do. It's, it's a real challenge. I, I actually think it's, you know, easier to go down to New Orleans and gut people's homes because you literally make a difference. Yeah. Hi, my name is Malik Burnett. I'm a second year med student. Um, my question is, Black in America won with, it, I like the way you say it, it had no real right answers. It just kind of brought out the issues. It uh, encouraged discussion and a lot of different things. And, and I was watching um, CNN the other day and I saw Black in America 2 coming out and then big underneath it said solutions. And I thought, what's the theme for that sort of thing? Because now you're introducing, you're, you're looking at it from, in Black in America 1, you, you brought a, a lot of different anecdotal stories to bring out a lot of so systemic problems within uh, the black We'll do a similar America. thing. I mean, we'll look at systemic problems again and the way people are attacking those systemic problems okay. um, so. in ways that are innovative, in ways that can be replicated to any community. Um, you know, I, I felt very strongly that we couldn't, you couldn't do Black in America 2 first, not only because it's 2, that would make no sense, but also because you can't do the solutions first. You, you have to lay out fairly and realistically and bluntly the issues. And after we did that, I felt like people literally were saying, my family's together, we're engaged, we've committed to, what can we do? And I thought, I, I don't really know. So I hope that one of the things will build around Black in America too, which is not my job, but they'll have many more, you know, will really leverage the interactive ability of the network so that people can kind of get a critical mass to work on things. You know, we, we, that's a, a huge opportunity that even in the year that has passed since Black America won, 
uh, has, has grown so much more, and, and we can facilitate that better. Hi, Soledad. Um, my name is Dorian Bolden. I'm actually a young entrepreneur opening a coffee house here in downtown. And uh, one thing I love Why, about where <laughs> is your coffee house for students who'd like to get a, who might feel the need for a cup of coffee, sir? Well, I actually have a gift for you, too, after you. I'm gonna take care of you. But, coffee? It's <laughs> called BU Cafe at Oh, BU. coffee beans? Ooh, this is good coffee. <laughs> What's it called? The Bell Bayou Cafe. I like it. But a place to be you. Be you cafe. Be you cafe. Be you so. cafe. And uh, it's the actually, only place I go. When I'm a dude. <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry. What's your question? Um, one thing I, I really appreciate about you, since I've been following, you, is the fact that you keep it real. And I've Me? always wondered. <laughs> um, yes, I'm sure my bosses appreciate that. <laughs> and I mean, I think you know, it's not hard to look at our society and say that image and perception is very important, especially to major corporations, um, even like CNN, a major broadcasting uh, company. But have you found it difficult to try to keep it real when you go cover stories, to talk to other people, um, or is that something you had to grow into? Um, and I guess as being an entrepreneur, I always like someone who's a go-getter, but it's not always easy, I imagine, um, sometimes being in that corporate structure to kind of I guess, speak your mind from the very beginning when you're starting off. You know, and I, I would never encourage it. I mean, I, what I like to think, I, I don't feel like I impose my view on people, but I, I like to give them food for thought and sort of bring around with stories, you know, kind of flesh out how someone might be thinking. Um, you know, I, I, what, where I have found it very challenging is all, in all these diversity conversations. When I first came to CNN, you know, I said, listen, I've been having diversity conversations for 20 years. It's now 22 years that I've been in the TV business. You know, and they're often the same conversation. We're really excited about diversity. It's very important to the company. You know, and then you realize it's really not. And I actually thought it'd be refreshing to have someone say, we really don't care about diversity. We care about shareholder value. So we're not gonna bother to waste your time in this meeting. You know, I mean, so for years, every place, I, you know, people would have these meetings and they were always the same. But there was actually no, you know, real heft behind it. And when I came to CNN, they actually put heft behind it. And they actually, when you go in and have conversations, the people who are really important, listen. I mean, it's why you see a change, you have seen a change over the last few years, literally in the face of the network. Part of that is driven by the bottom line, which is, if you look at our victories in primaries and our victory on election night, you see that there was a large number of African Americans and Latinos watching CNN. So along with the large number of white people, we won. People see that and they say, oh. So you appeal to a wider base of people and you can beat the networks even when we're only in 70% of households. You know, so it's a combination of that business case of diversity, but also Part of the reason, it's not just chucking people on, it's putting voices on who are respected, thoughtful, a lot of different positions and opinions, representing different parts even within a community, you know, that there's diversity within the diversity. So it, those are very challenging conversations, but I will say I get great support. I get great support. And to the point where I, <laughs> I got an award last year that was named after me at Morehouse. And my boss, the president of CNN Worldwide, gave a speech that the takeaway was sort of, she's a pain. It was like, we love Soledad for her bluntness and the fact that she's always pushing us. I was like, wow, that's not a really warm speech. But, you know, it was sweet because it was all about, you make us better. And they support that. And it's the first time I worked in a place that I really got that message. It makes a big difference. Please don't change. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, two more questions. Hi, I'm Becky. I'm a sophomore. I'm a Spanish major. Um, I was wondering if when you first heard that you were going to come speak at Duke, if you had any preconceptions about our university, um, and if you've gotten a chance to spend time on our campus, if you've been surprised or, or thrilled by anything you've seen. I had no preconceptions. I've been to the campus before. We were doing a documentary, actually, the year anniversary of the three lacrosse players. Um, that case being closed, we had started working on a documentary on it, and then 
uh, some of the families sort of pulled out and weren't interested, so before we really got started, the documentary kind of fell apart. So I've been to the campus before. Um, and, you know, the one thing, the, one of the reasons I like to speak to student groups is because you get great questions. You know, people aren't afraid. If you speak to corporate groups, often they don't want to rock the boat, so they ask very nice, loving questions. Ch students will challenge you. They will push you, and I like that, because if I can't answer I'll just say I can't answer it. And I, you know, I, I feel like I defend what I do because I feel very proud about what I do. So, to me, any preconception I had was that the students would have really smart, good questions because it's a great school and, and the people who would come and take the time would put time into thoughtful questions. And, and so, you know, anything that was preconceived turned out to be 100% accurate. Okay. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Stephanie Bazell. Um, I'm a junior at Duke. Okay, can I just tell people that I know you from when you were six? <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie's dad was my boss, Bob Bazell at NBC, and going to work for Stephanie's dad was like going to college. And, and a lot of the reason that I get to do what I do today is because her father is also demanding, a perfectionist, all about integrity. I'm just gonna go on and on. He, is, he was not only a great boss, but a great role model for don't take the shortcut. I'm sure you appreciated that in him as a dad, not. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> um. <laughs> My question was, um, I was um, in the minority as a big Hillary Clinton supporter when, and as one of the younger people, and I felt that when people would talk to me about it, they would explicitly say sexist things about it, whereas people who were talking about, I'm now a Barack Obama supporter, but the people <laughs> talking about Barack Obama would not, they would sort of tiptoe around the issue or accuse him of being Muslim or, or something that wasn't quite the same and just, I felt that the sexism wasn't addressed properly and that, that there should have been more outrage about it. You know, here's my thing about outrage, and I've had a lot, of, I've been on a number of panels about this, which is, 